I'm Shahar Azani, and in the news, political negotiations over the judicial overhaul in Israel. Now that Israel's Memorial and Independence Days are officially behind us, it's time to take a deeper look into the issue which has been on Israelis' minds the most, the proposed judicial overhaul. In the past few weeks, there have been continuous negotiations at the President's residence in Jerusalem between the various parties. Where does it stand now and what should we expect next? I'm thrilled to have with us on JBS again, all the way from Israel, our dear friend, Ambassador Dani Ayalon, whose wisdom and experience will help us navigate through the nowadays tumultuous and always stormy waters of Israeli politics. Ambassador Ayalon is an Israeli diplomat, columnist, and politician. He was Israel's ambassador to the United States, deputy foreign minister, as well as senior foreign policy advisor to Prime Ministers Ariel Sharon, Ehud Barak, and Benjamin Netanyahu. Danny, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. Uh, always good to be with you, Shachar. You know, first of all, I'd love to ask you about the commemorative days. How was it to experience Yom HaZikaron, Israel's Memorial Day for fallen soldiers and victims of terror, and of course Yom HaTzmaut, Israel's 75th Independence Day, in Israel in this atmosphere? Well, there was a lot of concern before, especially this very sacred, I would say, holy day of memorial. You know, this is uh, one, uh, maybe this and the uh, commemoration of the Shoah. Uh, you know, the Shoah remembers the, and the, um, remembers the day right. of uh, the fallen uh, Israeli soldiers. Uh, these are the two probably most sacred dates in the Israeli calendar. And uh, certainly, for uh, most Israelis, if not all, they are tantamount to uh, you know high holidays in in the in the sense of the uh, of the um, the importance of the sincerity of the identity of Israelis, uh, Jewish and the uh, democratic uh, Israeli uh, state. So uh, this time, because of the demonstrations and because of the rift, real uh, you know very deep rift between, I would say the uh, uh, anti-reform and pro-reform, uh, you know, for lack of better words, this is the uh, the, the way I, I will term them. You know, some would tell, tell them it's the um, uh, liberals against the uh, uh, conservatives. Some would say it's not right and left because you can see in the demonstrations against the reforms also many people from the good and from the right. It's quite interesting. So I would say against and pro at this, uh, at this point. And because of this big rift between these two camps, there was a concern that maybe this uh, rift will spill over to the uh, cemeteries. You know, this is the day where all the uh, bereaved families come to together to be with their uh, um, dear ones and and to 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 be there with special ceremonies. And uh, for these ceremonies, and you, you know, Shahal, you know it. Uh, probably as well as I do, the government always sends the representatives, you know, to lay read and right. to say a few words. And here, uh, some of the bereaved families objected uh, to receive and to uh, to have uh, government representatives speak. In some of the cases, the government representatives were, I would say, sensitive and sensible enough to say, okay, we will come and we will not speak. We will respect the, uh, the, 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 let's say, the request of the bereaved families, even though it's a breach of protocol, we will do it. Some others say, no, we will speak. Um, I would say out uh, of, um, you know, we have unfortunately so many grave sites, hundreds of them. Out of all these hundreds of uh, places, only one, I think, um, uh, had some kind of, ugly pictures where bereaved families who are for the reform were fighting those who are against. And this was in Beersheba. Right, we, we saw we saw the visuals, Danny. It was so disheartening to see these yes. arguments literally, physically, over the grave sites of those loved ones. It was yes. terrible. It was terrible. It was never seen before. I hope it will never ever be seen again. And um, also part of uh, the, uh, the, the, the very tensed 
atmosphere, I would say, was the personality of the representative from the government, which is Itamar Ben-Gvir. Itamar Ben-Gvir is a student of Kahana, which is considered here uh, by most, including Likud uh, people, as a racist. Uh, and uh, not only that, the claim against him was, and this, this uh, you know, carries some weight, you know, Shahar, that this Itamar Ben-Gvir did not serve in the military. Right. So how can someone who did not serve, who did not contribute, who did not risk his life, can come and, you know, speak to others? But anyway, he insisted on speaking. He did speak. Uh, we saw some uh, sorrowful sights. It's over. And uh, But all in all, I would say that the celebrations uh, after Memorial Day proved that I'm Israel Chai. Right. I, I'm totally with you on this. I, I have to ask you, though, something that comes to many people's minds, definitely our viewers. We talk about the judicial overhaul all the time, right? Pro and against. There is a halt in the you know, progress of this judicial overhaul, and yet you see you know, those minor clashes, thankfully, during the memorial services, but also there was a demonstration. The demonstrations continue every Saturday night. We, we saw signs you know, of the similar demonstrations um, during the Yom Mode Eve itself in Tel Aviv. If the judicial overhaul is paused, what is your sense of these demonstrations? Why do they even take place? Why haven't they halted? Simply put, Shahar, it's a matter of trust and confidence. Right now, there is no trust whatsoever between the government and the coalition. Uh, those who are uh, to negotiate a, uh, a deal which will be a middle of the road, which would really make sense for everybody. And at this point, nobody trusts the other. And unless and until we will reach some kind of a written paper and uh, with the, uh, at least with the general principles of what is going to be in the, the, this uh, reform, what is going to be out of the reform, what's going to be in the reform, once you have this paper, I believe that the tension will subside. And uh, because there is no trust, the people who are the anti-reform continue to come into the streets. And uh, what we saw last Thursday was that the pro, those who are for the reforms, also went out uh, to the streets right. uh, because they uh, are fearing that Netanyahu, his government, but himself mainly, will uh, just uh, buckle and will, uh, uh, in a way, uh, give too much to the opposition. So right now we see um, again, I, I see it as a measure of real strength of the Israeli vibrant democracy, where you see people which are caring, which are involved. You know, they are invested very much. They are invested emotionally. They are invested, I mean, uh, all of them, in, is in, in, in how the country is, what, you know, what role is the right. country going to take. So I think this is a sign of uh, great strength of the Israeli democracy. And I believe that once we will have, as I mentioned, the principles put down on paper about you know, what is going to be in the reform, I believe we will see uh, that uh, these uh, demonstrations, will see them subside. You know, I couldn't agree with you more, Danny. Um, you know, the idea of people who care, right? A lot of people, when they talk about modern day democracies or percentage of vote, they say, you know, people don't care, they're indifferent. That is one thing we don't see in Israel. We don't see indifference. And I think we should also see this as a blessing. But I have to, you know, you're a seasoned diplomat and very familiar with the Israeli political system. So listening to the voices coming out from the different camps, maintaining that leverage over one another through these protests, do you feel that these demonstrations might spill beyond the judicial overhaul into other realms of, uh, you know, um, controversy? For instance, demonstrating against the very legitimacy of this right-wing government controlling the Knesset with 64 members of Knesset. Now, is it right to say that at this point we're beyond the reform? Well, I would say they, uh, probably yes. And uh, what really is uh, at stake is not just the judicial reform, but it is, I would say, the, 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 the social fabric or the social order, the social economic order uh, of uh, the, 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 the country. Moreover, 
state and religion, you know, synagogue and state uh, relationship. Right. And, and everything will depend on what the government will do. Because uh, what happened, unfortunately, was that uh, with this uh, election of the government and nobody actually um, uh, questions the legitimacy. Uh, here, you know, the rules of the games were quietly adhered and, you know, not like in other countries, right. uh, we have free and fair elections, transparent elections, and the government won uh, fairly and squarely. There's no question about that. However, I believe that there was a, um, um, you know, a barrage of new, uh, newly uh, introduced bills that uh, not only related to the judicial reform, but also, for instance, to uh, actually deep, deepen the exemption of the Haredi, of the ultra-Orthodox, right. from enlisting to the military, for actually giving more uh, rights and more budgets to those who did not serve, as if they did serve, if they go to the yeshiva. All this actually brought into the surface all the... Um, the, the very, uh, I would say, uh, deep currents of Israeli uh, um, society, which were buried, you know, from government to government through different coalition, uh, right. you know, uh, all kinds of makeshift uh, deals and coalition deals. But now it seems like things have come out to the open because of the barrage of legislation that uh, encompass all, uh, I would say, facets of the Israeli uh, society. And this is I'm, why I think you are quite right in suggesting that it will not end up only with the judicial reform, but also there will be a, a larger, a broader discussion, uh, maybe all the way to the extent of drafting a constitution, which, as you know, we do not have. Right. For the sake of our viewers, we know something is happening at the president's residence. Tell us. What's happening there? What is what is the situation at the moment, and what is actually happening there? Are, are the negotiations are are they uh, significant or are they just symbolic? Well, so far it seems well. It, it wasn't uh, clear from the beginning, but it seems to be uh, uh, serious. The more they uh, uh, prolong and, and continue, and also you see by the um, composition of the teams. Uh, on the coalition, you have a very strong team. One of uh, the team's uh, members is uh, the cabinet secretary of the government, who is the closest aide, professional aide, to the prime minister. So you know the prime minister is very much involved in these negotiations. So this shows some uh, seriousness on the coalition side. On the other side, you see also a strong team, which is composed of the two main Parties in the opposition, which is Yeshati and and um, and Gantz, you know the uh, uh, the national camp. Right. And um, at the, at the moment, we see that at least they have decided on an agenda. Until last week, it was just uh, I would say uh, taking positions, uh, doing uh, more uh, PR than negotiations. But now, when they agreed on an agenda, uh, I think it's uh, going to be uh, more serious uh, negotiations. And I think the president, President Herzog, is doing a very good uh, job of really presiding over it, of really steering it in a way which is a very uh, gentle way in, a, in, in, in one sense, but also very, very uh, strict, where he doesn't let anyone wander off and keeps them focused on what's at stake. You know, um, we, we saw in the president's celebratory interviews for Israel's Independence Day, I think he stated clearly he will not hesitate to point the finger at whomever will be to blame for not reaching a compromise, which hopefully is a good sign, isn't it? Yes, and uh, I believe that this was also um, what um, one of the reasons that, that brought the government and uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu to hold the uh, the reform, because he was calling uh, for negotiations even before the official uh, halt and announcement by uh, Bibi Netanyahu, and uh, he suggested a few bridging proposals, 
and um, at this bridging proposals, Yesh Atid and uh, the Gans, uh, the national uh, camp, um, right. I guess national unity government or national camp, uh, accepted it. He came out in a speech, actually, uh, calling on the coalition that refused to accept it. Uh, so I'm sure he will not hesitate, and this is a real um, leverage that he holds, uh, possibly the only leverage that he holds over the uh, interlocutors. Right. But overall, you'd say that the mainstream of the Israeli public is very much desirous of a compromise. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. We know. We know what's at stake here. Uh, nothing uh, less than uh, the very existence of our state. And everybody understands from all camps, from all walks of lives, that after 2,000 years, 100 generations, we have achieved the real uh, wonder or one of the greatest miracles in the annals of history of mankind, which is building back, reestablishing our country on, on our land, especially after uh, the, uh, uh, the Shoah, and then, you know, just really coming from, rising from the ashes of the crematoriums in Auschwitz and Treblinka and all those places in Europe, all the way to where we are today, which is the strongest country in the Middle East, where we are at the forefront of technology worldwide, uh, with great military and strategic capabilities, great culture, and, uh, of course, technology, is, as I mentioned, uh, nobody's going to uh, uh, really throw all this under the bus or away. So although there are very, very uh, vicious, I would say, and very- uh, Intense uh, feelings. Bitter. Yeah. Bi yes, some bitter arguments. Right. Uh, at the end of the day, what binds us together is uh, bigger than anything else. And those who, you know, uh, also it's, I think it's very important to note that uh, when they uh, talked about uh, uh, maybe the uh, refusal of uh, some uh, military personnel, like Israeli uh, uh, Air Force uh, pilots, nothing of it is true. When there is a call, when there is a uh, threat, uh, an external threat on the country, everybody's coming together. And we have seen, Shahar, you have noticed probably that in the last few days, the uh, prevention and preemption uh, attacks, very precision attacks, very, very effective attacks, of uh, some, uh, you know, <laughs> I don't know if uh, we can uh, right. say who they were, but you, you can uh, imagine right. that uh, very, very uh, serious attacks uh, were taking place with jets that were flown by pilots, which, you know, and these pilots, they do not look at if they are from the right or right. from the left, right. they are Ashkenazi. They, they look started. straight ahead at the target. Exactly, and this will continue there is no doubt about it. Um, Danny, our keen viewers who follow JBS and you and understand a little bit of politics must have heard you talking about the prime minister behind the scenes of these negotiations. And it's by it's not a given, isn't it? Because of his indictments and involvement, you know, in the criminal field have somewhat prevented him from taking a stronger stand on these issues until something happens. So can you elaborate for a minute about that complexity? It, it is a very complex and almost unprecedented situation. You know, we have a prime minister who has been indicted, uh, who is undergoing a trial. Right. You know, there is an ongoing trial. So inherently, Shahar, there is a conflict of interest between the uh, the prime minister and uh, and and the state. You see, as as an as a prime minister. He is uh, the overall responsible for all the ministries in the government, including the Ministry of Justice. Right. So in, on one hand, he is the uh, big boss of the Ministry of Justice. Right. But on the other hand, he is being tried by the Ministry of Justice. So, of course, there is an inherent um, uh, complication and the conflict here. And this is why the Attorney General barred him from dealing with the reform. But this is not to say uh, whether he can direct his underlings which way to go. He is not involved. And this is the idea. This is the conflict. 
he cannot be involved in the nitty gritty. He cannot be involved in the uh, uh, the, the minutia and the details of the negotiations of what type of reform to take, what type of law or legislation to uh, to amend. But he can say either we hold it all together or please reach a compromise. And I believe this is uh, what he's doing now. He's just giving the direction, the uh, you know, like uh, where to adjust the compass uh, to, and uh, and nothing more than that. Do you expect, um, from your vast experience in this field, do you feel that the negotiations at the president will actually yield some sort of an acceptable compromise? I hope so. I hope so, because otherwise uh, we may go into another cycle of elections. Because uh, I don't think that, uh, you know, if, if there is a total breakdown of the negotiations, then there are two major options, you know, possibilities. One is that uh, the government decides to go full steam ahead with a reform. This is not possible because more and more people will come out of the streets. And also, you know, that today in the global uh, environment of the international community, we are not alone. We know that the American administration is very much against a one-sided reform. They, they don't talk about how to do the reform, but what they say over and over again, we just want or it's important for us that you reach a consensus, a wide understanding. Right. So without a wide understanding, um, the pressure from the outside and the pressure from the inside will be such that uh, the government will not be able to effectively govern. On top of that, uh, we have all the credit rating agencies like the Moody's, Standard & Poor, that are also warning the, um, you know, um, the outcome to the Israeli uh, economy. So this is a, an, an awful outcome if the, uh, the, the, there is a breakdown and we have a continuation of the reform as it was before. You know, on the you, other hand, yep. uh, if the government decides once, if there is a breakdown, to continue the uh, suspension or actually dropping altogether the uh, reforms, then we will have some elements in the government who oppose that. And that may be uh, also the demise of the coalition as it is now. So then we will see Ben Gvir and Smotrich, you know, Otsma Yehudit, uh, maybe the Haredim, you know, uh, the ultra-Orthodox also threatened that uh, not about, I mean, they want the reform because they also want to push in with it the, uh, the benefits that they want for the... Uh, uh, the drafting bill, right. Their students, exactly. So, uh, so again, if uh, it's like, uh, you know, you are... Uh, doomed if you do, doomed if you don't, right. uh, because then the coalition may, may break. Danny, in, that, in such a situation, do you see a chance that Benny Gantz's party might become part of the coalition? Okay. This could be another alternative where if the uh, ultra-Orthodox and Otsmayu did Smotrich and Ben Gvir, that they, if they vote, you know, they leave the government, Gantz is the only one that can keep the government um, afloat, you know, with the majority in the Knesset. The question is whether Gantz will want to do it or not. Right now, the sentiment among his voters is not to do that because he did it once uh, three years ago. We all remember that journey. And, and of course, uh, that did not work out. Right. And, and everybody understands that it did not work out because the prime minister didn't want it to break out, to, uh, right. to work out. And he is accusing Gantz and his followers, and not just his followers, they accuse Netanyahu of cheating and lying. We and go lying. back, we go back to your first point, Danny, trust. Right, and the trust. So here again, I, uh, right now, I find it very hard to believe that Gantz will join, unless there is such a crisis with an imminent and clear uh, threat from the outside. But short of that, I'm afraid that if these negotiations would not yield some type of compromise, we are headed towards another election. Well, hopefully, um, you know, the, the cost of Israel's societal fabric 
being torn or tearing slowly is, I believe, too high on all ends. And I join you in the hope that a compromise will be reached because there are so many issues that need tending and uh, we don't have time to waste, do we, Danny? Absolutely. We have Iran around the corner, you know, with almost 90% uh, enrichment, enrichment right. uh, grade uranium, which right. is a weapon grade. We have, of course, Hezbollah. We have Hamas, Islamic Jihad, and also the Palestinian Authority, right. which uh, continue with the, uh, this political terror, where they are continuing with their BDS, continuing to try and right. uh, uh, really defame us in... Uh, uh, at any international uh, body, including, of course, the United Nations and the Security Council. So we have a lot on our plate, which uh, I would say make more sense than not that we remain united. united. And again, unity is not uniformity. Jews will never think <laughs> uh, as, as one. Right. And I think one of the strengths of the Jewish people is that we, uh, you know, we argue with, with each other. This way we can synthesize and we can have self-criticism and we get ourselves better than any, you know, and, and rise up to the uh, circumstances and to the, uh, to the difficulties. Right. So I hope we will keep united. I'm sure we will keep united, uh, even if not uh, uh, as one mind. Thank you so much, Danny, your observations, your insights. It's always such a joy listening to you and we learn so much. Thank you very much. We, of course, share your hope for quieter times in Israel, inside and out. Thank you, Shachal. See you soon. See you soon. And to you, our viewers, an important announcement. As of this week, our weekly In The News is moving from Mondays to Thursdays. That means that our next In The News will air this week on Thursday and every Thursday as of now on. This will assist us in providing you with timely news and updates as we all here at JBS are focused dedicated and determined on doing. I'd like to thank you all for watching and thank you for joining us to this wonderful conversation with Dani Ayalon from which we've learned so much. I'd like to thank our director Sloan Copeland, JBS's acting CEO, Dara Golub, our technical manager Michael Paley, transmission manager John McDevitt and to our wonderful producer of In The News, Carol Lilienthal. For JBS, I'm Shahar Azani. Until next time, see you soon. Shalom and later.